and another cute shirt. Hi. So because we are all lonely and stuck in quarantine, I decided it would be a fun time to take a trip down memory lane and read some of my favorite childhood books. This video is definitely inspired by books and Lala, so I will link some of her videos where she's done similar things down below. So over the next week or two, I'm going to read five of my favorite childhood books. So when I was a kid, I was a big animal lover. So most of these books feature animals, I think all but one, <laughs> feature animals as main characters because that is just who I am as a person. So the first of these is Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. And this book follows an 11 year old kid named Marty who finds a beagle chain up around the corner from his school and he realizes that this beagle has a very cruel owner and decides that he wants to rescue him. I remember being obsessed with this book but it's been so long since I've read it and I am so excited to revisit it. The next book I'm going to pick up is No Dogs Allowed by Bill Wallace. Another dog book, surprise surprise. Bill Wallace was one of my favorite authors when I was a kid. He writes all kinds of books about dogs. <laughs> So I like I've read all of them. I love them so much. But I believe this one was my favorite and I read this one all the time. So this book follows a girl named Christine who after losing her family horse vows to never love another pet again because losing them is just too hard. So when her dad comes home with a new puppy she's really upset. But how can she resist a puppy this cute? The next book I'm going to pick up is Because of Win Dixie by Kate DiCamillo. This book follows India Opal as she moves to a new town in Florida with her father and she comes across this dog who is terrorizing a grocery store, ends up taking him home, cleaning him up, and he becomes her new best friend. This book is so cute. I definitely want to rewatch the movie as well. Oh, just looking at it, like I love it so much. Next, I'm going to pick up Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. This book follows a spider named Charlotte who has a habit of leaving messages into her web. Some of them have to do with this pig named Wilbur who she loves and this girl named Fern who saves Wilbur after he is born the runt of his litter. I was so obsessed with this story when I was a kid. I used to watch the animated movie like over and over and over and over again. I just loved it so much and so I'm excited to revisit this book as well. And finally as a kid I was a huge Nancy Drew fan and so this is the first book in the whole series written by Caroline Keene who if you didn't know is actually a pseudonym and these are written by a lot of different people. But anyway this one is The Secret of the Old Clock. So in this book Nancy meets a few new friends and learns that one of their close relatives has recently died and left all of his estate to these awful people and so all of Nancy's new friends think that there is another will out there somewhere so Nancy makes it her mission to find this will and help them out. I have read almost all of these books and I am very excited to revisit them and see if they are as good as I remember them being. So let's get reading. So I'm about three pages into Charlotte's Web and like I knew that it started out with her dad like going to kill the <laughs> Wilbur like the runty pig of the litter but it's just like crazy reading this thinking about a kid reading it like her dad leaves breakfast and he's going out to the barn with an axe <laughs> and she goes out there and she's like dad if I was the runt of the litter would you have killed me <laughs> like what it's just so crazy like I feel like something like this would never be written nowadays it's just so different I mean I guess it is true in like facts of life on a farm like that's how it is but it's just so funny like thinking about eight-year-old re me reading this and like not being phased at all I mean obviously you agree with Fern like you're supposed to agree with Fern that like you shouldn't kill the pig and you want to save the pig but it's just <laughs> it's just wild and there's like literally a picture in here of her like pulling the axe out of her father's hand like it's just so graphic <laughs> oh my god anyway i'm gonna keep reading they also just mentioned that they're having bacon for breakfast <laughs> oh my god just finished the first chapter and have another thing to say so fern who's like the main character that saves a little pig her brother comes down the stairs to like eat breakfast with them before he goes to school and he's got like in this picture you can see he's got a gun and a knife and he's just like casually walking into the kitchen with them like it says at this moment her brother Avery came into the room Avery was 10 he was heavily armed an air rifle in one hand and a wooden dagger in the other and then even worse on the next page the school bus comes and like honks outside and it says Avery grabbed his gun and another donut <laughs> and he went to the school bus what why is he taking weapons to school okay so I guess they are like toys but still this is wild there's so many weapons in this first chapter <laughs> I also just love how it's like Fern was thinking of the most beautiful name to name her pig and she came up with Wilbur. <laughs> 
I didn't remember all the animals being so mean to Wilbur. Look at him, he's, he's crying. The sheep is like, you pigs mean less than nothing to me. <laughs> what the heck? And Wilbur's like, how can you have less than nothing? <laughs> it's so sad. What the heck? He just wants somebody to play with them and they're all so mean. Wilbur just found out he's gonna be killed and turned into a Christmas ham. <laughs> is this book oh my god like it's such a good story and it's so cute reading it but then like stuff like that happens and reading it like as an adult I'm like oh my god how does a kid read this book and not be traumatized for life like what the heck okay so I'm now about 50% into Charlotte's web and they've just started getting into the main plot which is that Charlotte the spider is trying to save Wilbur from becoming a Christmas ham by writing messages in her web like saying what a good pig Wilbur is <laughs> it's just so cute it's such a funny idea and like all the townspeople come and gather around <laughs> like it's some kind of circus sideshow which I mean I guess if a spider was writing words in our web it would be Wilbur's like oh, I don't deserve all this love and attention and Charlotte's like yes you do it's just really cute <laughs> I am definitely loving it so far some of the stuff that I mentioned before is goofy but overall like it's such a cute story and I'm really enjoying reading it even now <laughs> poor Charlotte is dying alone and I'm crying <laughs> So I finished Charlotte's Web. There's a couple things that I wanted to talk about really quick before I wrap up my final thoughts. So once Charlotte starts spinning the words in her web, everybody thinks that uh, Wilbur is this like amazing pig, this miracle pig. And so they end up going to the fair and Charlotte comes with them and is like looking for a new word to put in her web at the fair. And so Templeton comes with them too, the rat, and he like, they send him out to go find words. And like, you can see in this picture here, he comes back with the word crunchy. <laughs> No, we cannot put crunchy in the web because then they'll start thinking about bacon. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, it's just so funny that she thought of all these things to include in this book. And like kids are reading it thinking of Flubber becoming bacon. Like it's terrible, <laughs> but it's also hilarious. And also later on, a little bit later on, um, Friend's mother ends up going to the doctor because she's so concerned that her daughter is like spending all this time with animals and not with other children. She's crazy. Imagine like thinking your daughter, your eight-year-old daughter is insane because she doesn't have any boy crushes. So you go to the doctor. Anyway, <laughs> she's all worried about Fern and the doctor is like, well, how's your other kid? How's your brother Avery? And she's like, oh, he's always fine. Of course he gets into poison ivy stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays, lays his hands on. He's fine. <laughs> Good, says the doctor. <laughs> I think E.B. White was a little bit ahead of her time and was throwing in some feminist diatribe and pointing out the double standard between the little boys and girls, but <laughs> you know, I appreciated that. So overall, this was definitely really fun to revisit. It obviously made me cry, as you saw. E.B. White has definitely created a really, really good story here that's enjoyable for both children and adults. The characters are just so real and realistic and their dialogue is so cute and relatable. And like Wilbur, for example, I didn't realize this as a child, but he really struggles with confidence issues, which is really interesting to read now as an adult. Seeing that, like he, when Charlotte first starts saying, spinning these words in our web he like feels like he really needs to live up to them like he's not already great and fantastic and radiant and whatnot and throughout the story you see him struggle with this but also overcome it with the help of his friends and I just think that's a really good message but this story overall is just so great and so nuanced it was just fun revisiting it and finding new things in it that I didn't appreciate as much as a child this book is definitely great for young and old alike as I said and I'm really happy that I revisited it and had a lot of fun reading it So I'm starting Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor and right off the bat they're like at the dinner table eating fried rabbit and the kid says I like fried rabbit fine I just don't want to bite down on buckshot. <laughs> Me and this kid are living different lives. This book I forgot but it actually takes place in West Virginia and I'm about like 10-20 miles away from West Virginia. I live in Virginia and that's pretty cool. It takes place near me but I don't eat rabbit. Okay, so I finished Shiloh by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor this morning, and 
it was really cute. I really enjoyed it, but it was interesting reading it after Charlotte's Web by E.B. White just because I couldn't help but compare them while I was reading them. To be honest, Charlotte's Web is a lot more nuanced and is a lot more layered of a story than Charlotte was. While Charlotte was really cute and definitely one that I would like to give to my future kids or would recommend to anyone with kids. It wasn't as enjoyable reading it now as an adult. I felt like I wasn't really the target audience. Okay, I'm back in a different outfit because I realized I didn't explain this book very well when I was talking about it. Basically, this book, the main character, his name is Marty, and as he is playing in the woods one day, this dog approaches him and is like really shy and timid but he finally gets him to come to him and he's like such a sweetheart and follows him all the way home and they figure out that it belongs to this man named Judd Travers. Down in the town he uses this beagle as a hunting dog and so Marty's dad makes them taken back to Judd Travers house. Marty already suspects that this dog is being mistreated just by the way he acts. He's really shy and skittish and when they get back to Judd Travers house he just kicks the dog which is freaking awful. Marty like tries to put it out of his head but he really can't and when he's playing up in the woods again this dog finds him again and follows him home again so Marty is like this dog needs me I'm gonna keep him so he builds his pen keeps it a secret that he has him. In the middle of the night one night he hears the dog crying and goes up there and finds that it has been attacked by another dog so they take him to the doctor and like Marty's parents definitely like feel for Marty and understand why he wants to keep the dog and do believe that he's being mistreated but at the same time they're like it's none of your business it's not your dog blah 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 but ultimately Marty strikes a deal with Judd for letting him keep the dog so that is the summary of the entire book in a couple minutes and now I'll get back to my thoughts it was a little bit too black and white for me. For example, the villain in this book is the owner of this dog, Shiloh, and he like mistreats this dog and is just really terrible. And he just was very one note for me, which there's nothing wrong with that, of course. This is a children's book. Like what made it worse is that Naylor like suggested that he might not be so black and white and that he was like abused as a child. But throughout the story, he's just awful. And like, you don't feel bad for him at all. He's just an animal abuser. And like, I don't really want to feel sympathy for any animal abusers. Like, don't get me wrong. But the way the story was written, it was just a little bit too simplistic for me to enjoy as an adult. I would have appreciated some more nuance, like I said, to the characters. And that it wasn't so good and bad, black and white. I mean, kids, I think, can accept that the world isn't so black and white and can understand these differences and why you might feel bad for somebody that's a bad person. And like the kid in this book, he lied a lot to his parents and hid stuff, but it never was really questioned. You always were on the kid's side. There never was like, you always were rooting for him, which I mean, he was the, it, this is difficult for me to explain. Of course he was the hero and you wanted him to succeed and you wanted this dog to be safe, of course. But I think just after reading Charlotte's Web where that was very enjoyable for me to read as an adult because I appreciated all the different layers that E.B. White put into it, this book was more difficult for me to appreciate as an adult just because it didn't have all of those different layers and I didn't really get anything new out of it reading it as an adult which I feel like a really well-crafted children's story should appeal to a wider audience than just children. So overall, I'm probably not gonna end up writing this just because, like I said, it wasn't really the target audience. I didn't really get anything new out of it as an adult. It definitely was a really cute story and I know why I loved it as a kid. I loved dogs and <laughs> this is a dog story and it's a really well-written and cute dog story, so. Overall, I really enjoyed reading it, but not quite as much as Charlotte's Web just because I didn't get as much out of it. So I've started my next book, No Dogs Allowed by Bill Wallace. This book follows a girl named Christine and their family horse has just recently died and she can't get it out of her head. She's very sad and misses her horse. But then for her birthday, her grandparents end up getting her this puppy and she is really upset. She's really mad. She doesn't want the dog. She really fights hard to not fall in love with the dog because she knows that she'll lose it eventually. I believe that it's going to like teach the lesson that even though it's hard when you lose a pet or an animal you have to really like enjoy the time you have with them and that the time you have with them outweighs the bad of losing them eventually so i i'm like halfway through just as a general overview so far i'm kind of feeling that this book is similar to shiloh and that it definitely is written for a younger audience and it doesn't necessarily appeal to me as much as an adult it's fun to read and there's nothing wrong with it but i'm not getting the same out of it as i did again with charlotte's web so far it's real well written and cute but there are just a couple things that i wanted to touch on the first thing that i have marked here is that there's this boy on christine's school bus his name is matt and he just is like always tormenting her and bugging her she's like complaining to her grandma about this boy and her grandma says maybe he was just trying to get you to notice him 
Can we stop teaching our girls that when boys pick on them, it means they like them? It's some sh Cut it out. I was really mad to find this in one of my favorite kids' books. I was like, what the heck? And later on, as I mentioned, it is Christine's birthday, which is when she gets the puppy. They're going to have her birthday dinner at this Mexican restaurant, and she says, I could eat queso and chips every day of the week. Same, Christine, same. So that boy that I mentioned earlier that was tormenting Christine on the school bus, his name is Matt. Th there's just this really cringy scene in here that I really like struggled writing and I did not remember at all about this book, but she's really like not into the dog and her parents like make her go out and play with the dog and she's just like lying in the field not paying attention to the dog and the dog runs away. She's like, oh shoot. She hasn't even named the dog yet at this point. So she's just like calling random names into the nether to see what the dog responds to and to try and get the dog to come back. And she calls out the name Matt and the dog comes. So then she's like, Oh, well, I guess his her name is Matt or Maddie. <laughs> and then the stupid Matt kid comes over later to see her dog and they're playing with the dog and he's like, what's the dog's name? And she says, like, she has to explain why the dog's name is Maddie and this stupid kid that she also, I think, is having a crush on, but it's just, it's just so cringy and annoying. I'm like, why couldn't you think of a better name for that? dog like why did that why why did this have to happen i also just kind of wanted to talk generally about how this is a very like odd unrealistic kind of premise like i can understand why the author wanted to get this message across and that the time spent with a dog is better and worth more than when you lose them but at the same time this little girl is just acting like so weird she like doesn't want to play with the puppy she doesn't want to touch it she doesn't want to look at it like it's very just very odd like i couldn't imagine a little girl like holding out for this long for this reason on loving a puppy no it's just a story but at the same time i think there still has to be a logical amount of suspension of disbelief and this is pushing the line for me i don't know why i'm being so critical of these childhood books but i think when there's stuff out there like Charlotte's Web that is just so well written and so perfect. This is like in our world and like what little girl doesn't want a puppy if she like loves animals. I don't know. I don't understand. That's just kind of me being um cynical and over judgmental of a children's book but <laughs> I mean that's what I'm thinking so I figured I would let you guys know. Hopefully I'll finish the rest of this today and then read the last two books for this challenge tomorrow and I'll keep you guys posted. So I finished No Dogs Allowed by Bill Wallace today and I still feel about the same about it as I did in that last clip. Ultimately, it wasn't that enjoyable of a read for me as an adult. Honestly, it's probably the least my least favorite that I've read so far. I definitely don't feel that it was written as well as a lot of the other ones that I've been reading. There was just a lot of telling and not showing. There were a lot of paragraphs that were just chunks of like Christine did this on Monday and she did this on Tuesday and she did this on Wednesday it was very repetitive and like I don't really care another thing that kind of bothered me reading this as an adult was that there was a lot of lines in the text where she's talking to her grandparents or she's talking to her parents and they like start to say something that's like racy or whatever and they're like oh never mind you'll understand when you're older and I really just don't understand what the point of including those lines in this book was because this book is clearly just written for children. It's not written for adults to read. I don't know if Bill Wallace just threw those in. If a parent is reading this with their child, they'll think it's funny, but it wasn't even funny to me. Like, so like the gist of that joke is it can be included in adult programs and media when like the audience is in on the joke and like gets what's racy and like the kid doesn't and that's what's funny. But in this book that's written for kids, what's the point of including that line? It's not funny. They don't think it's funny. They're just annoyed that they're saying this thing that their parents always tell them in a book. And I just hate that line anyway, even in real life. It's just stupid. Like kids are smart. They know what's going on around them. They can pick up your context clues. You're just treating them like they're less than. That's a pretty s specific complaint. But then again, not really because it showed up like three times in this 200 page book. They in the earlier clip, I also talked about how I thought that this was kind of gonna teach the lesson in that even though it's hard losing your pet, all of the good memories you have with them prior to that, it's worth that pain of the loss. And while that definitely was the message of this book, it also was a little bit, like tried to be a little bit bigger than that because Christine's grandpa is the one who actually gave her the dog. And he is very upset that she does not love the dog as much as he hoped she would. There's kind of this weird scene where it's revealed that he recognizes that she's having trouble loving the dog because she's afraid of losing the dog eventually down the road. and. This like hurts him even worse because he thinks that if she can't love this dog when she knows she's gonna lose her, how is she gonna love him? Because she's gonna lose him soon because he's got heart problems. It was kind of contrived and dumb. I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm being so harsh on this child's book. I'm so sorry. It's just funny because I thought I, I remember like loving this book so much and reading it as an adult it was just not the same experience, which fair enough, it's a kid's book. It doesn't have to be the same experience. For the purposes of this experiment, I won't be reading this since I am not the intended audience and I didn't really get anything extra out of it. And it is probably my least favorite so far. Did I say enough? I also started reading Nancy Drew and the Secret of the Old Clock today. And let me tell you, Nancy is a dumb I do not remember her being this irritating and stupid. I don't know if it's just this volume. Oh my god, she's irritating. I marked some places where she's either A, being a dumb or B, being not like the other girls, which is fun in a book for children. Nancy must also be a judgmental bitch because whenever she goes to anybody's house, they always are like, oh, well, you know, you have, just have to understand we're poor. <laughs> so she must be like looking around the house in disgust and they feel like they have to explain themselves because literally everybody she goes to see is like, oh, we're down on hard times. We're in financial troubles. And like, instead of offering to help herself, um, considering her dad's a lawyer and they're like very well off and have a housekeeper and live in this fancy ass house. She's like, oh, I'm gonna find the will of this old dead relative of yours that promised you he would leave you money, but actually did not end up leaving you money. But that's the whole premise of the book. There's like this extra will that she's trying to find. And so she's going around to all these different people's houses that this guy knew, trying to figure out where his will was. In school, Nancy had been very popular and made many friends, but through no fault of her own, she had made two enemies. Ida and Isabel Topham. This worried Hannah. The sisters, intensely jealous of Nancy, had tried to discredit her in positions she had held in school, but loyal friends had always sprung to Nancy's defense. As a result, Ada and Isabel had become more unpleasant than ever to Nancy. Yeah, Nancy's popular and beautiful and blah blah blah. Nice and kind, and these girls are just jealous. They're just jealous. Later, she's talking about the Topham sisters, and she's like, Ada tossed her head in. Her eyes flashed angrily. They did nothing to improve her looks. In spite of the expensive clothes she wore, Ada was not attractive. She was very thin and sallow, with an expression of petulance. Now that her face was distorted with anger, she was almost ugly. I pity any future husband of hers, said Nancy. I'm too discreet to engage in gossip with the saleswoman. Mm -hmm. Later, she's driving around town, and she goes, Pretty, oh, why can't all people be nice like this scenery and not make trouble? Nancy, I think you're the only making trouble. Nancy realized that although the Hoovers were poor, they had tried very hard to make their home attractive. She is able to change the tire quickly, because what does she not know how to do? Any other girl would have just been stranded, but not Nancy. She goes over to the Topham's summer house and starts snooping around, and somebody's like stealing stuff. She decides to hide in a closet and realizes she's trapped herself, and obviously they find her because she's an idiot and she sneezes. God, she's so dumb. Anyway, they find her and lock her in the closet and then she's stuck, and that's where I am right now. So I have like... 70 pages left. Overall, I'm not enjoying this so far. As I mentioned, Nancy's a dumb bitch. It's not very like well written. The dialogue is so annoying. Nobody speaks like they do in this book. Nobody acts like they do in this book. I'm gonna go finish this one and I'll keep you updated on our dumb bitch Nancy. So I finished The Secret of the Old Clock and I can confirm that Nancy Drew is still a dumb bitch. I overall was not a fan of rereading this book. The writing was very simplistic and honestly just made me roll my eyes. The dialogue in this book is so unrealistic, like nobody talks like that. The characters are always like saying the plot points, saying very obvious things that we don't need to be told because we get it from the context clues kind of thing. So that was kind of tiring to slog through. And overall the plot's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> And silly which is fine for a children's book but it wasn't very enjoyable to read now as an adult and Nancy was just very tiring as a main character like everybody is always talking about how great and wonderful she is and how many talents she has and I was over it and by the end of the book I was like okay we get it I definitely am not the target audience for this book I did not get anything new out of it reading it as an adult it overall was not that enjoyable of an experience rereading this on a little bit of a lighter note, I started Because of Wind Dixie by Kate D. Camillo. Oh, I love this book so much. I'm about halfway through and I just, I love it so much. It is so, so good. It is so well written. This is what a children's book should be. It's enjoyable to read as an adult. I get something out, new out of it every single time I read it. It is just so well written. 
and it's simplistic like it doesn't have to be really complicated it just the language and the descriptions and everything just flows so nicely and fits so well together and they're so easy to read and it just creates this lovely atmosphere you just feel like you're there in this warm small southern florida town and you just get that from these snappy descriptions and the way the characters talk it's a testament to good writing and it makes me so happy to see this in a children's book and one that i loved as a kid it's so fun revisiting this one for sure because it's just a good story it's just simple enough for kids to read and understand and love as well i also really appreciate how the author does not shy away from hard topics india opal's father explains to her straight up that like her mother was an alcoholic and she left them india opal is living through that too like she deserves to know what happened i think that's amazing like kids can understand that kind of stuff they know what's going on and i just appreciate a parent in a book recognizing that and acting on it and speaking of India Opal's dad, I just love him so much. He's such a great representation of like a single father, being good at being a single father, but still figuring it out obviously, but he's just so great. And I love that when she finds Winn-Dixie in the grocery store and brings him home, keeping him isn't a fight. <laughs> she just is like, I found this dog, I'm in love with him, I'll give him a bath, he needs a home. And her dad's like, okay. <laughs> When Dixie's really afraid of thunderstorms, she's afraid that her dad is going to be upset that when Dixie is so scared of these thunderstorms, say we couldn't keep a dog who went crazy during thunderstorms, but instead he's just like, we'll have to keep an eye on him. Gotta make sure to keep him safe. She thinks all of a sudden it was hard for me to talk. I loved the preacher so much. I loved him because he loved when Dixie. I loved him because he was going to forgive when Dixie for being afraid, but most of all, I loved him for putting his arm around when Dixie like that, like he was already trying to keep him safe. <laughs> Tearing up. Oh my god, this book is so great. We love a good dad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. I also just love the inclusion of everyday magic in this book. It just makes me feel like being a kid. Cause when you're a kid, you can't really differentiate as well between like what's reality. And so everything is a little bit magical to you. I just love how this book makes you feel that again. For example, India Opal is in this pet store and the pet shop owner Otis, he's in there serenading the animals with his guitar and they're like all in a trance. And then as soon as he stops playing his guitar, they go crazy. And it, that's just such a cool scene to me because obviously it's tinged with a little bit of unreality, but it's just this like everyday magic. As a kid, you believe in that kind of stuff and feel like that kind of stuff can happen. And it's just cool seeing that in this book and being reminded of that and feeling that feeling. I also really think that Otis, the guy in the pet store that plays the guitar to the animals, is such a great character. He is an ex-convict and he tells Opal this and Opal's like, okay, cool. <laughs> And then she goes and talks to her friend Gloria Dump about Otis and she's like, should I be scared of him because he's a criminal? And Gloria goes, you can't always judge people by the things they've done. You've got to judge them by what they're doing now. You judge Otis by the pretty music he plays and how kind he is to them animals because that's all you know about him right now, all right? And it's just such a good message. It's something that I need to re be reminded of still today as an adult. It's just a message that everybody needs to hear every once in a while kids and adults alike. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about these kids books that are universal and can be enjoyed by people of any age and people of any age can get something out of them. Like this isn't just a cute story, like this is something that makes you think, makes you feel things, and I just really freaking appreciate that. Honestly, this is probably one of my favorite books of all time. So right now I'm like halfway through I'm gonna finish this up and I'm sure we'll end this reading vlog on a happy note because I adore this book and it definitely will get five stars from me. So I finished because of Winn-Dixie and everything that I said previously still stands. This book is just such a breath of fresh air and it was so fun rereading it as an adult. I loved all of the characters. I loved the atmospheric nature of the writing and how it just made me feel that I was there with India Opal in this small southern Florida town. And I just really enjoyed the life lessons that are included in this book. They're are not just life lessons for kids, they're things that we need to be reminded of as adults as well. So rereading this as an adult definitely was still an enjoyable experience and I really felt like I got something out of it. This just was an absolute joy to read and probably was my favorite reread of this experiment. All right, so I have read all five of some of my favorite books from childhood. This was a really fun experiment. I really enjoyed it. I think if I had to put these books in order from least favorite to favorite, I think I like equally didn't really enjoy these, surprisingly. So maybe Nancy Drew is my least favorite. And then No Dogs Allowed. And then Shiloh. God, this one's hard too. I think I'm gonna go with Charlotte's Web 
as second to best. And then I think Because of Winn-Dixie is gonna be my absolute favorite. But I did really enjoy reading rereading both of these. Shiloh was fun, but it was a little bit too simplistic for my tastes. And No Dogs Allowed, it was fun rereading it, but at the same time there were some things in it that I and that I kind of had issues with. And then Nancy Drew was just kind of uh, badly written and it made me really sad that I did not enjoy rereading this. So overall from this experiment, I think I learned that some childhood books are best left in childhood. While on the other hand, there are some gems that are perfect for reading as a kid and as an adult in that they teach you lessons or make you feel emotions that are still applicable when you are an adult. I'm glad that I had so many books around me when I was a kid and I really don't have any serious complaints about any of them. They all are great in their own right. But I did really genuinely enjoy rereading Charlotte's Web by E.B. White and Because of Winn-Dixie by Kate D. Camillo. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching me reread some of my childhood favorite books. Let me know what some of your favorite books from childhood were down in the comments below. I would love to know. All relevant links will be in the description. If you liked this video, make sure you subscribe and give it a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And thank you again for hanging out with me. I'll see you in the next one.